I am live. I am reading out of The Lad and the Lady. It is a, a book written by Joan Marshall Grant and this is actually <clears throat> a, a fictional novel. She has in the past or in uh, before this she wrote a lot of books about her previous incarnations uh, but this one is actually a book she wrote um, as a novel. Uh, it was published in 1949 and because I'm fascinated by John Marshall Grant I'm going to read this book aloud. I have not read it before. This is chapter 3 of part 1. No excitements. No excitements. <laughs> There were still five cigarettes in Rowan's case, but instead of going back to offer one to Marilla, he decided that first he required time to think how much she need to be told. He did not want to cause her unnecessary embarrassment, but if he lied it would be awkward if she suddenly regained her memory. Damn it, what else could he have done? She had seemed quite coherent. She had not even winced when the ed when Honorine insisted on dabbing iodine on the cut and pulling the edges together with sticking plaster. Torbayon had brought a bowl of broth and then gone upstairs with his wife to light a fire and make up the beds. Malwilda had drunk most of the soup and kept on assuring him that she was perfectly all right and did not need a doctor. She had tried to walk upstairs and then had to admit she was too shaky so he had carried her. When he told her to put her arms around his neck so that he wouldn't jolt her, she had seemed to think it perfectly natural. Honorina had put hot water bottles in the bed and laid out a nightdress, a voluminous, voluminous garment with tucks and lace and little buttons at the neck and wrists. Of course he thought she would stay to look after Marilda, he had been an ass not to explain that the inc that the accident included meeting Marilda for the first time, but he had been too concerned about her to embark on explanations, especially in French. How could he have expected Honorina to say, it is better when one is a little confused to be alone with someone familiar. Monsieur's room is next door. I will leave Madame now, for she will be safe in the care of her husband, and to leave the room before she, and to leave the room before he had time to protest. Marilda had started to apologize again for being a nuisance. He ought to have realized that being repetitive was a symptom of concussion, but he had to make sure she took off her wet clothes, for her teeth had begun to chatter with cold. He tried to make her promise that she would undress and get into bed the moment he left the room. Perhaps he sounded impatient instead of desperately worried about her, for when she bent forward to unlace her shoes, she said, like a child, My head hurts, and I am so cold. I can't think properly. Oh, please forgive me for being such a nuisance. Please, don't be cross. So what else could he do but take off her clothes and wrap her in a blanket and sit with her on his lap by the fire. She hadn't seemed to mind anything except that she, she cried. So he had told her an entirely imaginary story about he how he had been bomb happy in Italy and wept on the shoulder of his sergeant major. She had said, you have a very comforting shoulder. And so he had not told her not to waste it. So he had told her not to waste it. Then she had cried a little more and laughed at the same time, but this was only because she was beginning to relax, not through hysteria. Or if there was a shade of hysteria, it was only a very natural reaction. He didn't know how much, he didn't know much about her, except it was obvious she had been terribly lonely because she had said, I haven't cried on anyone since I was seven. I'm 23 now, so that makes 16 years of not letting anyone know what I really feel. So he had kissed her, for why let her go on being lonely a moment longer than was necessary? She had fallen asleep suddenly, 
like a small child or a puppy. It had been rather difficult putting a nightgown on without waking her. He had had to leave some of the buttons undone. She woke only when he tucked the bedclothes round her. Surely she must remember kissing him good night. While he dressed, he had considered a plan of action. Unfortunate, very, that Marilda wasn't Scottish, for Georgina was ridiculously prejudiced against Americans. But he was tired of being the docile grandson of Georgina, so she would have to stop disapproving of Americans. How could Marilda help being born in the same country that had bred his grandfather's first wife, the heiress, the heiress who had brought disaster to Cloud and whom Georgina had always been jealous, and of whom Georgina had always been jealous? Georgina would also be difficult because of Janet, the cousin he had been expected to marry, a good sort Janet but not at all the kind of woman he had secretly hoped to find. Well, now he had found her, and proved that the tradition of love at first sight could be maintained by a hard-headed Scot. Come to that, he was practically married already, for under the old Scottish law it was sufficient for a man and woman to declare before two witnesses that they were man and wife. Was Marilda already married? Georgina would be even more annoyed if there had to be a divorce. It was typ typical of Sir Rowan Cairdry, 14th baronet and 23rd laird of a small but belligerent clan, that it never occurred to him, after finding his lady, that she might object to being carried off to Castle Cloud. People who tried to, be to come between them would require sympathy, if they were masculine, they might also require hospitalization. He almost hoped that Marilda had a husband who must be vanquished, or at least a couple of suitably disagreeable brothers. There are few aspects of chivalry which the true Highlander does not cherish in his heart. He wondered if Marilda liked fishing. If not, he would teach her, and the first summon she caught would be stuffed and hung in the gun room at Cloud. A tap on the door broke the thread of this pleasant anticipation. Honorina entered and announced, Dr. Chavain is with Madame. Madame, I sent a message to him by the postman. Rowan abruptly returned to immediate realities and silently cursed himself for not having foreseen this complication. He had forgotten that Marilda had amnesia, was it possible that she might also have forgotten that they were in love with each other? Perhaps she had told the doctor they had met only last night. He might insist on her going to hospital. Relations might appear and try to take charge of her, try to keep them apart. Monsieur must not alarm himself, said Honorine kindly. Monsieur le docteur will, I feel sure, tell him that in a few days Madame will be herself again. She opened the communicating door and Rowan saw a small man with a grey, pointed beard standing beside Marilda, who was rendered speechless by a thermometer. The doctor looked up and gave a formal bow. How do you do? said Rowan, trying to get some clue from Marilda's expression as to his role. Could he ask her or did, they, did, did the doctor speak English? The doctor removed the thermometer and gave a little chuckle of satisfaction. There is no fever, he said happily. In these cases, the fever is an indication that all is not as it should be. Damn, thought Rowan, he does speak English. Now what do I say? He gestured to Marilda behind the doctor's back, trying to tell her to, make, to take the initiative. She lay back on the pillows, a smile lurking at the corners of her mouth. How's her pulse? said Rowan, playing for time. Pulse? Rowan thumped his chest, then pointed to his wrist. Pulse, he said more loudly, as though emphasis would make his meaning clear. Ah, that too is good. The doctor beamed. It was seldom he had so pleasant a duty as to reassure such a handsome and no doubt gallant young man. Her head? Rowan pointed to his own to remove any, any doubt. 
Her head is good too, adding to himself. Stop speaking pigeon English, you fool. We must be careful for the head. Two, three days of complete quiet. With such injuries, there can be complications. Yes, complications, he repeated. They must be watched or bad headaches and worse things may follow. It would be very unwise to move her, said Rowan hopefully. It would be a folly. Madame la Marquise would be desolate if you were to go away before I give permission. He chuckled. Madame la Marquise and I always consulted before one of her unexpected guests could leave the chateau in safety. Her hospitality to the English does not cease with the war. They did so much to give back France to us. Are not our houses always open to them? It's very good of you, said Rowan formally. I'm sure we appreciate it most sincerely. He sounded so much like the captain of a cricket side receiving a cup that he lapsed into silence. He decided Marilda was laughing at him. Why didn't she give him a hand, a lead? She hadn't, so he would take the initiative and leave the explanations to her if he made things difficult. My wife, he said, is sometimes disobedient. You must tell me what she may do or else I shall not be sure she is carrying out your instructions. With our wives we must be firm. They are so charming and at times so careless of their health, exclaimed the little man. If Rowan thought he had scored, Marilda was not going to let him know she agreed. But monsieur, you must impress on my husband that I might not that I may not be bullied. He is at times a little impatient. I know it is only a way of hiding his anxiety for me, but she gave a delicate shrug, suggesting burdens endured without complaint. The doctor bristled. But monsieur, I insist that madame is treated with the utmost consideration. She must be indulged in every way. Her slightest wish must be your law. You are so kind, murmured Marilda. I know he will listen to you. I shall thank you properly when I am less fatigued. The doctor drew the curtain across the window. It is well that you should try to sleep now. If the head pains, you will take the little sedative I have left for you. He turned to Rowan. Perhaps monsieur will come down to the car with me? The butler was waiting for them in the hall, holding a silver tray on which were a decanter and two glasses. Tobaya never forgets, said the doctor contentedly. A glass of Beaujolais is excellent for the constitution. He prodded Rowan with a brisk finger. One understands that you and your most charming wife had had a little disagreement. Even at seventy one remembers what it is to be newly married, but for a few days there must be no excitement, no quarrels, and above all, no reconciliations, I make myself clear. Perfectly, said Rowan, cursing the embarrassment which he was unable to conceal. An admirable wine, a little young, but one must not complain in these days, said the doctor, convinced that he had done his duty. With quick, short steps which made him look as though he had springs concealed in the heels of his old but still dapper cloth-topped boots, he went down the wide steps. Rowan followed him across the inner courtyard through the formal garden where a broken rose bush marked his earlier progress to the ancient Peugeot outside the great gate. The doctor started the engine and leaned out to deliver his final instructions. I shall visit Madame before the end of the week, but meanwhile, no excitements. So that was chapter three. Chapter four is entitled Teamwork. Have a lovely Sunday evening.